Happy Sabbath. It's wonder how, wonderful to see all of your beautiful faces in church today. Let's begin praising God by opening to number eight in the hymnal, We Gather Together. Please join me in standing for today's opening hymn, I'll Go Where You Want Me to Go, number 573. In men on me, on the mountains
to go, dear Lord, our mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me Surely somewhere a lowly place in earth's harvest fields so wide, where I may labor through lines of play for Jesus the crucified. So Trusting my all to thy care, I know thou love me still. I'll do thy will with heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. Where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain, or plain, or sea, I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me Happy Sabbath. Be seated. Thanks, Sam. Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Pleasure to join you on this bright, sunny day, for, which will be sunny for a few hours before the rain comes. Um, so uh, today, do we have any visitors? I, I know a couple of uh, forehands there. All right. All right. So um, the Rivera family, greet them and uh, welcome them to the church. And uh, any other visitors? Okay, well, uh, uh, church policy, Nick and Anna, uh, once you're a visitor, you're only a visitor once. After that, you're family. So, so welcome. And then, uh, which is a reminder that immediately after church service, um, uh, that we're going to have potluck downstairs. So after pastor says amen, start filing down. All right. Um, Monday, uh, there's going to be a prayer meeting physically at the church at 6 p.m., and then Thursday via Zoom is the PAS school board meeting, 6 p.m. as well. Um, uh, this is not in the bulletin, this one, but I actually ran it to, uh, to uh, Celia this week. Uh, she wanted me to remind everyone, April 16th is the women's tea. We know that's a big event, so mark that on your calendar. And if you're interested in doing a table, make sure you reach out to Celia. Uh, June 5 through 9 um, in the evening, at, VBS will be at the church this year. And then um, there's sad news about Ann Hoxie. Unfortunately, um, she's gone, gone to arrest. So if you're interested in sending any cards, any condolences, her, um, her son's uh, info is in the Bolton. Now, uh, Jason, you got something that you wanted to share? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm in charge of doing the Monterey Peninsula SDA Church podcast. We have about 22 episodes where I take all the pastor's sermons and guest speaker sermons and put them into smaller, more easy to listen to episodes so you don't have to watch the whole church service. And it's easy and um, fun to listen to. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram at MPC, MPSDAC, um, that's also on Spotify as well. The video that I am presenting is from Justin Koo. He is a digital ministry um, person who does his own ministry through videos, through posts, that talk about church and the Bible and 
People are in this kind of digital world. They're spending significant amount of, of their lives behind screens. And so for those who care about preaching the gospel, I don't think that we can afford to ignore the online world. In fact, I think that there's a certain degree that proper stewardship of the gospel requires us to be online. Thank you. All right, for those digital folks, they have it there. And then there's also the YouTube site that where we, we live uh, cast the church, so, which is especially good if, um, if you can't make it for Sabbath. You, just, you, know, you can uh, live stream the church. Uh, one of the few good things that came out of COVID is we started doing that, right? Um, the last bit that we've got here is, um, is there's a job posting at the uh, conference. Um, that information's right there. So if you're interested in that administrative assistance, make sure uh, you uh, follow the instructions. So for prayer requests today, um, I've got one for Joseph, who's battling cancer. I've got one for Maria for osteoporosis, Norma for financial issues, Margarita uh, fell down, um, got a big 15-inch long cut. Uh, we got for Glenna uh, for transport, uh, transportation to um, Belize. And then for Johnny, for travel money back to um, Montana. And then I have two unspokens. Are there any other unspokens that anyone wants to add with a raise of hand? Okay. So at this time, uh, I'm going to kneel. Those who are able, please kneel as we sing the first verse of 671 as we come to you in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this chance to come together as a church family, to kneel before your throne, and to have uh, you come into our lives. Uh, Lord, you promised us where two or three are gathered, you're in our presence. Since we more than exceed that criteria, we pray that you will be here right now with us. Uh, may your Holy Spirit bless us. Um, we pray for all the, the prayer requests that were lifted up. Lord, we know that you're going to answer them in your time and in the right manner. And Lord, um, we pray for those who have lifted those prayers up to you that um, they that they will uh, know that your answer is coming soon. Uh, most of all, Lord, we pray that for all the hardships in there with the, the loss of Anne, with the challenges of Joseph, Maria, Norma, Margarita, and Johnny, Lord, we know that those uh, are just fleeting trials in this earth, and that ultimate reality is you're coming soon to bring us home. So we pray that you hasten that. We ask, Lord, that you bless the pastor today, uh, his spoken word, that um, as he lifts up his message, that, uh, th that the message will be the one that you need us to hear for this time and this moment and this day. For this, we pray in your name. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Um, do you guys remember what was created on the fifth day of creation? Oh, your birthday. All right. Congratulations. It was not man. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what was created on the fifth day was the birds of the air and the fishes in the sea. Now, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite animals in all the world, the Chinook salmon. Now, the Chinook salmon is an amazing fish, and it is also called the king salmon. And it starts its life as a little egg in a deep river of clean, pure water. And as it hatches and it grows, after about a year, year and a half, it goes out into the ocean. And it lives in the ocean for about one to eight years. And then it'll return back to where it was born to spawn and to die. Now, how much, how much do you weigh, Kellen? Um, maybe like 65, I'm pretty sure. About 65 pounds? The average adult Chinook salmon weighs 10 to 50 pounds. However, they can get up to 126 pounds. So it might weigh as much as you and your two brothers combine. <laughs> and the average length is 2 to 3 feet, but they can sometimes grow to 5 feet. Now, when they travel back home to where they were born, they can traverse a long distance. In the Alaska area, in the Bering Sea, the salmon who return through the Yukon River can travel 1,900 miles. It goes, it snakes around all of Alaska, which is the largest state in the U.S., all the way back to Canada. That's a long distance. Now, I looked on the map, and the distance from LA to Chicago is about 2,000 miles. So that's almost the distance that these salmon will travel to spawn. Now, there's a place in Idaho where they will climb 7,000 feet in elevation, but only traveling 900 miles. Now, the tallest mountain, do you know what the tallest mountain in Monterey is? Jack's Peak. Jack's Peak is 1,068 feet. So these salmon will travel almost seven times the height of Jack's Peak to reach their destination. Now, when they're going upriver, they sometimes have to jump because there's waterfalls, right? And so these... These fish will jump, jump, jump. And when they jump out of the water into the air, sometimes they don't reach the water. They'll hit rocks or other things. And sometimes there's other obstacles as well. Sometimes they have these things called bears. Are you familiar with bears? They're pretty big, right? And you know what bears love to eat? They love to eat salmon. And so sometimes they'll just sit by the rocks. And as the salmon are jumping, they'll catch the salmon in their mouths midair. Now, if you can get some permission from your parents, maybe you can go on YouTube and see these videos where the salmon are being caught by bears. Now, the salmon are aware of the bears. And yet, they will journey on because they have this drive to spawn. Now, sometimes... There are other barriers. There's other distractions. Now, when the salmon are traveling, they do not eat. They have one goal in mind, and that is to spawn, have babies, and die. But sometimes a person like myself might pick up a lure, and you see how it spins around? So sometimes salmon will be distracted from their goal. 
And this thing spins around in the water, and sometimes they're hungry, so they might think it's a piece of food. Sometimes it's irritating, this flashy thing, and they go, what is that? And they just bite it. And when they bite onto that, what happens? Uh, it hooks on. That's right. It gets hooked, and my family has dinner. <laughs> so... The journey of a salmon is kind of like our journey as Christians. It's sometimes filled with hardships. It's sometimes filled with danger. But it's also filled with distractions. So what is going on in your lives that will distract you from following God and not making it to your destination and becoming someone's dinner? That is our challenge. Now let me read you a, a verse. This is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse... Sorry, my eyesight's not as good. Um, yeah. uh, 1 Peter 5, 7 and 8. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So in our lives, we have the devil who is prowling around like a hungry lion to eat us up. <gasps> Scary, huh? But we can cast all our cares on Christ and he will protect us. Okay? All right. If you guys can quietly walk to your seats, thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Okay, I'm going to read Psalms 37, verse 1 to 7. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land of, and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cows like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. We're very thankful today to have our special music come from a family from Weimar, Klingbell family. We'll bring that music to us now.
and share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away, and just like Jesus said, come to the waters, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every teardrop, and in darkness you So to remind you that for those tears I die. Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul. I know without God I never be whole. Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to Thank you so much for the special music. There are times in your life when God guides you in a very special way. I've shared some of the stories in my life about God guiding. There's been many times when it seems like God tells me to be in a certain place in a certain time, and those times are very special, and I know there are some of you here that have had those kind of experiences. I want to talk about one of those experiences today from the Bible and then talk about one that is currently going on that we need your prayers for. Right time, right place. I don't see the remote up here. Does anybody know where it's at, guys? We'll need that. Thank you. We're going to be looking at the story of Esther, if you want to follow along in your Bible. 
I'll have most of it on the screen for you. Thank you, Jerry. There's the outline. We're going to talk about Haman. He's the evil villain in the story, in the Bible, if you're familiar with the story of Esther. Haman's plans, why Haman's plans failed, conclusions, and then the appeal. All right, let's see. See if it's working. We'll push on the button. There we go. Haman's plans. Now it's going. The setting of Esther's story happens about 475 B.C., and then you can see the chart where Christ is on the screen, the cross, and where we are now. In Esther chapter 3, verse 1, it says, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agarite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Sometimes someone prospers that maybe shouldn't. And it seems as if that person seems to excel, and we wonder why. And then in verse 2, it says, All the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were with the king at the gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. They had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Now, why Mordecai decided to not bow down and pay homage when he sits in the king's gate and he's commanded by the king to do it, almost all the commentators are puzzled by that one. Because Mordecai was being defiant. Whether it was a religious belief that I'm not going to bow down to anybody but God, we don't know that. Maybe he just didn't like the guy, Haman. Maybe he had words with him. The Bible doesn't tell us. I'm going to talk about that point later on in the message. Then Haman convinced the king to destroy all the Jews in his kingdom. Let's pass a law, get rid of these people that don't follow our laws. They have their own set of laws. They're really not worth having around. And the king says, sure. So the king took the signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said, Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Just in case the king didn't want to follow along his recommendation, he's now the king's main advisor. He said, I'll pay you a lot of money into your treasury so you won't lose any tax money, it won't affect you. And the king said, oh, that's all right. You keep the money and just go do what you want with the Jews, with these people. So now he has the power. He's in the position. And then, as... The story goes along. Haman continued with his plans for Mordecai's demise by building a gallows to hang Mordecai upon. When he talks to all his friends, if you know the story of Esther, he complains about this guy Mordecai, and his friends say, well, why don't you just hang him? He says, oh, that's great. I'll build this gallows 75 feet tall, and we'll just hang the guy. So the story continues, and it seems like Mordecai is in trouble. Haman went to see the king early in the morning to ask permission if he could hang Mordecai. And he got a surprise as he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Before Haman can ask the king's permission to hang Mordecai, the king, he asked him a question. What shall be done for the man that the king delights to honor? You see, the king had had a dream. And 
he couldn't sleep, I guess, and he had someone read to him. And so while he has someone read to him, and they read about Mordecai, and Mordecai saved the king's life by telling him about an assassination plot. So the king's thinking, I'm going to do something good for Mordecai. But that's not what Haman knows. He doesn't know any of the background. He doesn't know what's going on. Because Haman is so caught up in his own plans to destroy Mordecai and the Jews, he thinks that the king is thinking of honoring him. So he gives the king an elaborate plan to honor himself. And then he's humiliated when the king tells him to carry out the plan and go find Mordecai the Jew and do all the things you said. Put a robe on him, set him on the king's horse, walk around and say, if the king wants to honor someone, this is what they look like. That must have really been hard for Haman. He was really upset by that one. Why his plans failed. Sometimes people seem to prosper, and we're not sure why they prosper. And it seems as if they're on the right track when really their plans are not going anywhere. Why he failed. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Anybody ever hear that verse before? You ever hear that verse? We apply that to God's people. And it says, my people. Let's look at the verse for a minute. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And it mentions the children being forgotten. You see, God loves everyone. Amen? He doesn't want people to go astray. He doesn't want people to be fighting against him. And Mordecai, or Haman, forgets this point. He has this lack of knowledge about God and God's love for his people. The knowledge of Esther and who she was, that was part of his problem Haman had a lack of knowledge. Haman had no idea that Esther was a Jew. His demise came as a complete surprise as, as Esther's second banquet. And you know the story where Esther is hesitant to go in before the king when she's not summoned. And she goes in anyway when Mordecai encourages her to. And she fasts and prays for three days and asks the other Jews to pray for her. And then she says this famous line in the Bible. What is it? If I perish, I perish. And she's willing to risk her life for God's people. And she goes before the king and he holds out the golden scepter. What a wonderful story. Haman has no idea that Esther is a Jew. His lack of knowledge is going to do him in. And then he had a lack of knowledge about God. The Bible says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's plan for you today is to give you a wonderful future. He has a plan for you that you should prosper and you should be blessed by his hand, his presence, his power, his guidance. That's his plan for you. Can you say amen to that? That's God's plan for you. But everyone in life may not know that Haman didn't know that about Mordecai and the Jews. That God's plan for his people is that they be blessed by him. The Bible says, for he who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. So I want you to know and to leave church today when we're ready to go knowing that God loves you, He cares about you, He has plans for you, and He wants to see you blessed by His presence. Amen? How many want that blessing? Okay. He who touches you touches the apple of His eye. But Haman didn't know that. In Proverbs 21, verse 1, it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of the water, he turns it, what does it say? Wherever he wishes. You see, Haman's got the king in his back pocket, so to speak, because he's the number one man in the king's 
arsenal of people. And the king gave him the signet ring and the power to destroy the Jews. So Haman has no concerns that his plans might go in the wrong direction. In 2 Timothy 2.19, it says the Lord knows those who are His. Amen? He knows where you live. He knows what you think. He knows the intentions of your heart. Doesn't it say somewhere that He would bless you and give you the desires of your heart? I think it's Psalms 37, verse 4. In Jeremiah 1.5, God says about Jeremiah, I, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Now, sanctify means to make you holy. How many here have done things in your life you're not proud of? Anybody? Now, you won't raise your hand. I'll raise two hands. Well, one for you and one for me. I've done enough for both of you. All of us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. That means make you holy. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. When my mother and my father were married, my mother and father had some problems, and my mother and father were divorced when I was two. All the while I was growing up, I've heard my mother tell me the story that she didn't want another child after the second child came along. There was my older brother, Zell, and there was my sister, Janet, and then there was me. And I wasn't supposed to happen because there were issues going on in the marriage, and it broke up shortly when I was two, after I was born. And so my mom wasn't so sure about what was going on. And there were things that were happening that weren't supposed to be happening. And so... I'm the one that wasn't supposed to be. And yet, the Bible says, I knew you before you were formed in the womb. I sanctified you. That takes a lot, but it says it. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God has a meaning, a purpose in your life for you. His purpose for you doesn't begin when you're 27 years old. It doesn't end when you're 45 years old. God wants to use you through your whole life. Amen? In Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, it says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, Destroy. You see, when people go up against God's people, God is aware when you run into obstacles in your life. How many have things in your life that maybe could be considered troublesome or an obstacle? Anybody run into things like that? This last week I had a couple of those things happen to me. It was a rough week. The power went down at my house. It was down overnight for hours. When they put the power back on, when they put power in the house, they're supposed to bring in, there's the, the neutral, and then there's supposed to be two other lines, and they're supposed to have one tin on each of those lines. Well, something happened when that took place, and guess what? I was outside talking to the man when they hooked it up, and he was standing there watching the meter to make sure it came on and it was running okay, and it looked like everything was okay, so he said, okay, it's working. He jumped in his truck and he drove away, and I walked in the house, and my wife said, Gary, something's going on, and I hear pop, 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 pop. Light bulbs are exploding in my house. I look down the hall, and the multi-plug at the end of the hall is smoking. As I run down the hall, it catches fire in my house this week. I jerk it out of the wall, and there's smoke in the house. The fire trucks come out. Everything's fine. But there are obstacles week by week. For some reason, they severed the neutral line coming in, and they tell me that makes all the power go to one side, 220 on something, and I checked the power quickly in my house, and sure enough, one line had 220 and one had nothing, and I thought, something's really wrong. 
So we got it under control, but there are obstacles sometimes to receiving God's blessings. There are things in the way, but the Bible says the eternal God is your refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. God's going to win in the end, and that's good news for us. Amen. Conclusions today to what we're talking about. How can you get around the obstacles and things in life that come up? Well, look at the story. God is still able to put people in the right place at the right time. Amen? He's still able to do that. Do you believe that today? How many of you believe that he's able to put you in the right place at the right time? Okay. Psalms 32 verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I need his eyesight because I can't see tomorrow. I can't see later on today. Let's look at people in the story of Esther to start with. First of all, Esther to be the new queen. Esther's parents, for some reason, aren't in the story. And she's taken in by Mordecai and reared by Mordecai. She doesn't have a normal or good family life in some shape or form for some reason. Maybe she's the last person to be in line to be queen. But she becomes the queen when Vashti decides not to honor what the king says for one reason or another. And Esther is chosen. Mordecai happens to hear a plot about the king being assassinated. And he reports it to Esther, and Esther reports it to the king, and it's written in the annals. And then when the king can't sleep... He says, oh, bring the book of the annals and read to me. Maybe that'll put me to sleep. And so they read the story about Mordecai, and the king says, what was done for this man? Nothing? Who's in the court? Haman is walking into the court at that particular moment, at the wrong place, in the wrong time. And he's looking for permission to hang Mordecai. And so the king asks him, what will be done for the man the king wants to honor of course, Haman says, well, <laughs> I'm probably the one he wasn't thinking of. So he thinks of this elaborate plan. And then he has to go do it for Mordecai. And he's humiliated. Mordecai is in the right place at the right time to be elevated in the king's mind. Haman comes into the king's court after the king couldn't sleep. What about in our lives? Instead of in the Bible for a moment, let's bring it into focus in God moving in our church here in Pacific Grove. We have a school here, Peninsula Adventist School, PAS. Our principal is with us today. Raise your hand. Ivan, come on. That's all right. He doesn't want to do that. That's our principal. You met him. He preached to us. Wonderful man. Very skilled in what he's doing, doing a great job. We're glad he's there. But the school... We went through COVID, and the school is going downhill some, and all the different things that have happened. We're glad to have him. Well, a little bit ago, I was uh, told by the conference that I had to go to a meeting in Fresno. Two or three weeks ago, I had to be gone, and if you remember, pastor's retreat was in Fresno. Well, we went to that meeting, and at that meeting... There was a session the new president had with all of the pastors and, that were there. And he said, I want to listen to some of the challenges that you face in your churches. And I want to hear, and we're going to write them down. And I just, you say anything you want. Well, the fellows talked, and they talked, and they talked. And it went on for three, three and a half, four hours. It was a great meeting. One of the pastors stood up, and he talked at that meeting. Pastor Vargas, at this pastor's retreat. And he said, I wish that I could get a school started in my two churches. He's got a district. I don't know if he has two or three churches, but he has two, Albury and another one. And he says, we really need, but we can't afford a school. Isn't there some way 
maybe through this means or that, that we can have a school. And at our school, we got to know the principal a little bit at a school board meeting, and he's familiar with distance learning, where you have a school set up with a teacher that's qualified to teach through online training. Yvonne did it during the pandemic. So did Ivan do it during the pandemic, where some had to stay home, and they looked at TV. Well, the conference leadership in the education department hasn't been willing to do that past COVID. But this man stood up, Pastor Vargas, at the meeting, and he said, I wish we could get a school, but we can't afford a teacher here yet. When he got done talking about his need, he looked over at me, and he was sitting across the room from me, and I said to him, I can help you. And he understood that. So as soon as the meeting closed, I ran over and I met him, shook his hand, and I said, you know, we have a teacher that's qualified in doing distance learning. Maybe we can help each other. We can help you get a school started for your kids. Your 15, 20, 25 children can come to our school virtually, distance learning, and we can have more students, and that would help our school. It would boost our attendance and help our school grow. Well, he loved the idea, so we exchanged information. Immediately in the meeting, there's a man in charge of the education department, and I ran over to him in the meeting, and I said, I just met with Pastor Vargas, and he has someone that wants to start a school, and he can't afford his own teacher, but we could do distance learning. Well, the gentleman in the conference right now didn't like that idea, and he said, you should have come to me with the idea. And I said, what do you think I'm standing here talking to you for? Well, that was the end of it, and he took off and went his way, and I went my way. But I wasn't done. So I wrote a letter to him making a formal request for to allow this to happen. And this is not allowed in the conference right now, according to current policy. And at the bottom of the letter, I put, I'm looking forward to your enthusiastic support of this project. And I put P.S., I'm also sending copies to the new president and the administration of the conference. Well, then, about a week later, in the afternoon, I had to be over at MBA for a special afternoon meeting a couple weeks ago. If you remember, we advertised it here at the church. When I got to the meeting, the president saw me, and he called me over to his side. He said, Gary, I knew I'd see you here. I got your email about that idea. I like that idea. What I want to do is give you 30 minutes to make a presentation at the conference so we can think about the current policy we have. I thought, great. <laughs> so he was busy for a week. He says, I'm going out of town, but I'll set it up about a week later, about a week ago. I got a notice, and he called me into the conference office, and I had the opportunity with the head of the education department, the president, the second man in control, and a bunch of other people sitting in a room. And they gave me 30 minutes to make a presentation that maybe our principal could be teaching students and setting up a new school over in another area. And that's against a couple different policies that are currently in place. Well, I got a text about last week, about five days ago, that said from the president, he said, Gary, thank you for challenging us in our current mindset. And then I got another text a couple days ago that said, Gary, set up a budget and an outline of what's going to happen and send it in to our education department leadership and copy me on what's being sent. At this point in time, I think the doors are going to be thrown open for us to have distance learning at our school. It looks very promising. I feel like God has placed me in the right place at the right time to make a difference and maybe open the door and change things. So I've been listening to your prayers that that continue to happen because it's biblical that God can still do that kind of thing. Our new principal happens to be very skilled in doing that and has developed software programs and things to do that. And I told the conference about that. Our new president is interested in reaching people that we're not currently reaching. 
When I got there at the meeting, I was told that there were three or four other people there because they were part of Fresno Adventist Academy. And the original response I got from my email asking for this to be done from the head of the education department was, I'll recommend they enroll them at Fresno Adventist Academy. And that was it, the end of it. But then the president said, Gary, come and talk to us. So the door is being opened. And I want us to keep praying that God will open that door because it can be a boom in Albury and the other church that's setting up a school. It can be a help for the students that we can't reach right now because there's transportation issues over to Salinas. There are students over there that want to come to our school but can't afford it because of travel time, because of the distance for many reasons. Distance learning could be set up and open in a pilot program, and it looks like it's going forward. We're talking about being in the right place at the right time. It can happen to you. When I was talking about this concept with Patty this last week, she shared with me how God has done this to her numerous times, so I've invited her to come up and tell, tell you about her car. Patty? Um, it has been in need of a lot of work. I know a lot of you don't know. My car sat in the driveway for three years while I cared for my family and rusted, basically. Um, by trade, I'm a real estate appraiser, and so I drive up to people's houses, and it kind of matters how my car looks. You know, I really don't want to scare them away before I get to the door. Anyway, so I have nephews. I have a nephew that's a mechanic that works on my car, um, but car parts are expensive. The part I needed was a back hatch. I priced it a couple years ago, around $1,200 just for the piece, um, nothing else. So my nephews called me two weekends ago. They were at the junkyard, and they found a car like mine, the exact same color, and it had a good back hatch. So my nephews got in there and took it off and brought it home. They paid $35 for the back hatch. My nephew works in a very high-end shop. They do one-off cars. They're the only people that move the cars at Concorde de Elegance. Um, but because my nephew's kind of like family to them, I got sucked into, and they actually allow this car in that shop. And so for a total of $185, I have a new back hatch that doesn't leak. They got rid of the old one. Everything works, and I was extremely blessed. So. And it's the same color of your car. <laughs> it can happen to you in your life. It doesn't have to be a big thing, like a major policy shift in the conference policy. But it can be in little areas that God can say, I love you, I care about you, I'm guiding you, and I'm leading you in your life. Amen? My appeal today is this. If God can work through imperfect people like Mordecai. Now, why do I say that? Mordecai, who wouldn't bow down and pay respect to Haman when he was told to by the king. He can work through all of us here in Pacific Grove to tell others that Jesus is coming back soon. Amen? You see, the commentators are puzzled why Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Now, let's assume that Mordecai had a quirk. It wasn't just a religious thing. It could have been, but there were a lot of Jews that fasted and prayed. But Mordecai wouldn't bow down even though he was told to do. So let's say he was a little bit ornery or contrary. You see, God has taken into account your quirks, your shortcomings, and he's going to work around you and with you to see that you prosper and are blessed if you will stay connected to him. Amen? Amen? So according to what we're saying in my appeal, if God can work through imperfect people like Mordecai, he can work through me, he can work through you. Amen? In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Now, this is an interesting verse because it says the last line, I will also forget your children. Do you know that Haman, the villain in our story, 
what they did with his ten sons? They hung them all. I will forget your children. When people go up against you, if you're the apple of God's eye, and you want to stay close to him, what knowledge do you need? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Are you spending time walking with Him, getting His guidance in your life, getting the Spirit to dwell in you that you might be His messenger today, tomorrow, this week, as you go forth in your life? The Bible says your ears would hear word behind you saying this is the way, walk you in it, whether you turn to the right or whether you turn to the left. How many of you want that guidance in your life? I want to be guided by Him. The happiest place on earth for me is where my Lord would have me to be. The happiest thing that I can do is work my Lord has called me to. The happiest song my heart can sing is that of praise to Christ my King. The happiest path my feet can make is that I tread for Jesus' sake. The happiest sight my eyes can see is sight of Christ-like purity. And the happiest sound my ears can hear is that my Savior draweth near. It is my prayer that this week you will open your life and your heart, your mind to be influenced more by His dwelling in you, by His guidance in you, so that you will be guided to be in the right place at the right time. He still has the power to do that. Let's sing together as we stand. hymnal it's number 493 like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy and then speaking drop from my well that never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I want my cup, fill it up and make me home. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford, but none can match the wondrous treasure in Jesus Christ my Lord fill my cup Lord lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I want no more fill my cup Fill it up and make me whole. So, my children, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you need. my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsty 
King of my soul, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come today in need of your guidance, your presence, your power. Lord, guide us in our life moment by moment, step by step, that we might be led where you want us to be, that we might say what you want us to say. Lord, help us to see the needs around us, to reach out and tell others about your great mercy, your love, your power, to overcome sin and to be ready for when you return. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.